Hi, uh, welcome. I'm Ma Maris Kreisman, and I'm so thrilled to welcome you tonight to another excellent virtual event at McNally Jackson. If you go to McNallyJackson.com and look at our events calendar, you'll see all the amazing writers and programs we're hosting in the coming weeks. So please keep an eye on the site or subscribe to our newsletter to hear more about what's coming soon. There will be time at the end of tonight's conversation or whatever time it is where you are uh, for your questions. So start thinking about them now. Uh, you can put your questions into the Zoom chat at any time and we'll get to them towards the end of the evening, afternoon, night. Um, we're glad that even though we can't all be in the same room at the moment, we're still able to host events during this difficult time. As we've weathered the pandemic and reopened all four of our locations for browsing and shopping, indie bookstores like ours still need more support. And so if you enjoy free events like this one and want us to keep hosting more of them, please buy books from us. Throughout the even evening, sure, I'll post links in the chat to buy Rebecca's book from McNally Jackson. And I am so delighted to introduce the author of the hour, Rebecca Handler, is a writer who lives and works in San Francisco. Rebecca's stories have been published and awarded in several anthologies, and she blogs regularly at onewomanparty.com. Edie Richter is not alone is her debut novel, and in a starred review, Booklist writes, Handler's ED has joined the ranks of unforgettably eccentric, intelligent women protagonists. And Kirkus Star Review says, a tragic comic exploration of the collateral damage of Alzheimer's disease. Handler gets it right from the title on out. ED is definitely not alone. And joining Rebecca this evening is Andrew Sean Greer who is the Pulitz Pulitzer Prize winning author of six works of fiction, including the bestsellers, The Confessions of Max Tivoli and Less. Greer has taught at a number of universities, including the Iowa Writers Workshop, been a Today Show pick, a New York Public Library Coleman Center Fellow, a judge for the National Book Award, and a winner of the California Book Award and the New York Public Library Young Lions Award. So happy to have you both and would love if you'd start us off in a conversation. I am uh, so happy to be talking with, <laughs> with you, Rebecca. I, I should let the audience know that it is 10.30 for me, I'm in Italy, which is why I've tried to give you a stereotypical background. I'm mm -hmm. not in my house. Um, I wanted to know if you could tell us about your swim this morning. <laughs> <laughs> yes, oh my gosh. Um, so hi, first of all, thank you everyone for coming. I'm so excited and I see so many familiar, wonderful faces on here, which is so great. Um, uh, yeah, I'm in San Francisco and I like to swim in the San Francisco Bay and have been doing it most mornings during the pandemic. Normally I go to the Dolphin Club with Andy sometimes when he's in San Francisco. Um, but lately because it's closed, I've just been going in from my car to the Bay. And this morning it was nuts. It was super wavy and blustery. It's what I like to call gnocchi weather because I feel like a little piece of gnocchi just like bouncing around in the ocean. Um, it was crazy. Yeah, I was with my brother and I called out to him. <laughs> you know how people say that you get the kid you need? Maybe we're getting the water we need this morning. <laughs> so awful. apparently I needed to be like slapped around because <laughs> that's what happened. I, well, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. It was crazy. Um, well, well, let's 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 get to your. I also I scrolled through um, the looking at who is here, and it looks like your mother is here three times. Oh, hi, mom. Hi, mom. Hi, mom. That sounds about right. Um, I'm my questions about the book um, are really um, Edie Richter is not alone and there is in the chat there's a link to where to buy the book through the independent bookstore here so whenever that comes up everyone I'm, I'm so because I'm struggling with my writing right now and so I'm picking everything apart to see how you did something so successfully um, one thing my question is about is the book is in these is written in fragments um, fragments feels like the wrong word though. They're, they're often connected, some go in the past. How did you find that, that form? Well, I wrote 
let me first say, I'm going to give a brief description of what the book is about, because I right. think that most people on here have not read it. So let me do that. And then I can explain how that links to the structure of the novel. Um, so the story is about a woman, Edie, who has recently um, lost her father and she is in deep grief. And she moves from San Francisco to Perth, Australia with her husband, um, thinking that maybe the remote um, location will provide some sort of respite for her or help her through the grief. It does not, however, it sort of stimulates the exact opposite of that. Um, she carries a very dark secret with her that is really ripping her apart. Um, the novel is about aftermath, um, secret keeping, and the discovery that we are never completely alone. So that's kind of the synopsis of the story. And so it has a lot to do. Her father has early onset Alzheimer's and um, the novel is set up in a way to mimic the experience of having Alzheimer's in that you're, you're plowing through life and then all of a sudden you have a memory. Um, and it also shows connections between memories and the present. Um, I wrote it in that way with not only the intention of providing sort of a, a like a meta window window into Alzheimer's, but really to give people, I think a lot about the reader um, when I write and with the experience I would like to have for that reader. And I want the reader to be able to digest this book either in one sitting, it's a short novel, or in very small increments. Um, you can read two pages of this book and hopefully my goal was that you have something to think about. Um, and that's why I did it that way. I, 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 just, I just love this book. I think for exactly that reason, because I love a book um, that, you know, like a poetry collection you can kind of pick up somewhere and find your way. But I will say like, I read it again today and it was a joy because oh. it's, a, it's a one sit down on the couch and read it book, you know, a couple of cups of tea. I Well, and like one thing I've, I've really enjoyed hearing from some friends of mine who've read it in the past week since it came out last week is um, I have some friends and I, I was in this situation for a while during COVID where I found it really hard to concentrate and really hard to get through um, even a whole chapter in one sitting frankly, because my mind was all over the place. And so a compliment that I cherish that I've gotten from some friends is like, it's gotten them back into reading <laughs> because they, it's, it's grabbed them in some ways, they can read a little bit of it. And um, they look at the size of the novel, which just feels like manageable. And I love that. I think books should be really accessible um, and make you want to read more. But as well, so actually speaking of reading more, mm -hmm. maybe you can read us a little bit and mm -hmm. then that'll give us a sense mm -hmm. of what we're talking about. Okay, um, I'll read for a few minutes. I was gonna read um, from chapter two, Ooh. which is surprising. Um, and I just wanna give a little bit of context before I start. Um, Edie's father has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Um, there's references to Oren, who is Edie's husband and also Abby, who is Edie's uh, much younger sister. <clears throat> I couldn't figure out whether dad was technically dying, but we moved from Boston to San Francisco to be closer to him. Oren had wanted to get out of the snow anyway, and he got a job at Coral, an oil company based just outside of San Francisco. I quit my marketing job and picked up some freelance work writing fundraising letters. We got a small apartment in the inner Richmond district, three blocks from Golden Gate Park. After dad's diagnosis, mom started labeling things and let dad grow a beard. She went to a baby store and bought plastic child protection locks for the kitchen. Just so he won't stab me, she said, as I wrestled with one of them trying to get a corkscrew out from a drawer. You remember Tanya from my walking group? Her mother attacked the cleaning lady and they had to move her into a home. Dad's illness was hard on Abby. She was 22 and living at home trying to be a blogger. She became vegan and woke up early every morning to run five miles. She started doing most of the cooking for mom and dad, mostly curry, mom told me on the phone. 
I think your sister is trying to give us a permanent case of diarrhea. Not that I'm not grateful. My sister came along when I was 14. Mom didn't think she could have any more children, but her body proved otherwise. One rainy night, dad woke me up and said, we're going to the hospital to have the baby. Mrs. Whitaker is downstairs on the couch. He was home the next morning to see me off to school and they said they named her Abigail and what did I think? I told him it matters more what she thinks. After all, it's her name. Always the practical one, he said, pinching my arm and pulling me close. I can't wait for you to meet her. Mom and the baby came home three days later. Abby had jaundice and needed to be kept under ultraviolet light. Jaundice is no reason to keep a baby in the hospital, mom grumbled as she sat down carefully on the couch, as if we don't have lights in this house. Edie, be a dear and get your mother a glass of water. Dad handed me the baby, swaddled in a blanket with blue and pink footprints and said, Abby, meet Edie, she's your big sister. I looked down at her red cheeks and her tiny nose. Her eyes were closed and she was wearing a lavender cap. She weighed practically nothing, a strange little animal. I felt her sigh. How do you know she's yours and not some other baby? I asked mom. Dad untucked the blanket and pulled out a skinny arm to show me her wristband. See Edie, mom's name is on there. My thumb and index finger fit easily around Abby's wrist. Her fingers seemed extra long. I held her hand up to my nose and inhaled. She smelled like macaroons. Then I smelled her head and kissed her on the cheek. What's for dinner, Abby? I teased. What are you gonna make for us? My parents laughed in apparent relief. My sister turned into a very talkative person. She was scatterbrained and always looked like she fell out of a ceiling fan. Mom saved a copy of a form she filled out for Abby's kindergarten teachers. Responding to the section, tell us anything about your child that could be helpful to the teacher, she wrote, Chatty Patty, and Abby has a propensity to express her strong emotions and needs to be reminded to have more self-control. Abby expressed her emotions in the form of shouting and new hobbies. Now with dad's illness, it was cooking, mostly stews. At first, dad wrote post-it notes and stuck them everywhere, to the bathroom mirror, his bedside table, Two kinds of notes, explanatory, you have problems with your memory, and directional, use the blue toothbrush. Later, the notes became, this is your house, and your wife is Louise, and your children are Edith and Abigail. Mom decided to sell dad's auto parts shop and through a series of compelling lies, convinced dad to sign some papers, and that was that. It was purchased by a national chain of mechanics that did mostly oil changes and smog checks. When I was growing up, dad's longtime employee, Igor, used to spend a lot of time at our house. He was a gay Croatian who loved Neil Diamond and wore head to toe denim. He'd bring over saltwater taffy and say, all right, ladies, what's happening? He and tiny Abby would dance in the living room or we would all watch reruns. Sometimes in the middle of a show, he'd sigh wistfully and tell me what a great man my dad was. He'd say, he takes care of people, Edie. When mom sold the business, she asked Igor if he'd be interested in living with them and helping care for dad. He said he'd be honored. He moved into my old room and became dad's babysitter, always next to him, discreetly fixing things dad would break like coffee mugs or conversations. He'd, quickly, or he'd quietly apologize when dad yelled at the pharmacist. Mom started working part-time at a children's clothing store thanks to a referral from Tanya from Walking Group. Mom hadn't worked in 30 years. She'd sigh with thinly veiled pride and fake grumble. They need me to come in this weekend. They're swimming in ponchos. Your dad would understand. Whether he would or wouldn't understand wasn't important anymore. Mom liked to feel needed, and they were swimming in ponchos. <laughs> Thank you. Detail, detail, detail. That's the, the beauty of the book. Um, all in denim, saltwater taffies, gay Croatian. I've uh, never seen it anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> I 
often my family is often uh, baffled by my books because they see they recognize some things that I've made into a collage and like often it's the details that they notice but then they realize that the characters are are not are fiction mm -hmm. and that it's kind of like what one of those crabs that sticks things all over itself or something and <laughs> totally. you know totally and I often have to tell them I'm sorry you're not enjoying the book but there's only five of you <laughs> you know you'll you'll no one else will ever know I mean right. do you find that you've I don't want to ask you what what de what details are real and what aren't I want to know how you made the world so real um thank you I mean it is really all in the details I think um, and there's actually a part in the book where Edie is talking about details too. She is a character who notices everything and um, she collects details and she doesn't even really know why. And that I do have in common with Edie. Um, I, I watch people carefully. I feel like I always have. Um, when I think of someone, I immediately attribute like, you know, the way they hold their coffee mug or a certain accent that they might have um, or some beautiful little detail that makes them human. Um, I do write a lot of things down all the time. So I have various notebooks that I keep track of things in, um, especially as I get older, I don't remember details as well as I used to. Um, but yeah, I would say like my, this book is really, um, it's inspired by um, like loosely inspired by my experience of my own father who had Alzheimer's for several years and died in 2013. It was not early onset in the way that Edie's father has it, but um, all of the details of Alzheimer's are certainly um, taken directly from my experience with my father, as well as my experience with my friend Beata who died of Alzheimer's, or died of, um, had some dementia at the end of her life as well. Um, and it's almost like, yeah, it's like I take these details and then like twist them and make fiction out of them. It feels very um, sensory to me, writing and very, um, like I said this recently, I feel like a, more of like a sculptor than a writer sometimes where I, I, I create a whole mass and then just sort of shave away at it and leave specific details that hopefully give a really good visual of a character and make it feel more um, real, if that makes sense. Well, and I think particularly um, you had two life-changing events that were that never happened to anyone else. And so you were forced to pay attention, maybe in a way most of us don't. And one mm -hmm. was father's illness and death. And another was moving your family to, to Perth. Um, <laughs> and which happens in the book in, in a very interesting way. And then also it's a great way of sort of escaping any of like a novel that's about me at home with my family after my father's death. Instead, the book takes us to a foreign place where there's nothing brings up a memory. You know, there's no rifling through through old, you know, any of that. Why yeah, did you, and there's, I mean, there's nothing like, I mean, I, I mean, you're in Italy right now, so you might be able to speak to this live, but um, there's nothing like pulling yourself out of your home country in order to see yourself a little more clearly. I mean, I've always been, it sounds, sounds pretty cliche when I say it out loud, but I've always really been drawn to living in other cultures, not just to experience another culture, but really to, you know, take a different kind of look at myself. Um, and I think that kind of started from college, really. I studied anthropology way back in the dark ages when I went to undergrad um, and loved it. And that really stuck with me. And so I think I, in my writing, I look at, I kind of come at it from like um, an ethnography standpoint almost, where I'm trying to write, uh, like, like really do a recording of someone else's life, um, but in a, in a objective way. Does that make sense? Do you feel like your, your anthropology background is, I mean, now I can see it, like totally. of the next door neighbor, particularly. Uh -huh. We get such a clear view of something that I'm sure most Australians would not, they would walk by that house and pay no attention. Mm -hmm. Edie, it, it has a particular fascination of normality, but normal in another sort of- Well, like, 
culture? Well, you know, when you go to, and you don't even have to go to another country to have this, just go to a, a nearby town or a new place, any new place. And I find um, like, I'll, I'll go do something like a very regular thing in another country, like go to the grocery store. And I will start thinking like, ooh, look at all of these people doing their grocery shopping. <laughs> like, let's, <laughs> let's look in their cart and see what they're buying. Like, oh, they probably have children. They're buying a lot of sugar cereal or whatever. Um, like, I don't know. I find that it's, um, it's fun to observe people, you know, in their natural habitat. <laughs> which I guess you can just do in your, in your own city anyway, your own, own country town. But. but Well, I think you're right that it really, because a lot of it, you're watching yourself. I particularly here, I've noticed uh, toilet flushing as something I hadn't expected in Italy. I've noticed for years, every toilet you go to flushes in a new and surprising way. Oh, is there a pulley thing? There's often a pull, but yeah. it could be the emergency cord, which legally they have to have <laughs> bathroom so you have to make sure not that because okay. it it could be on the wall sometimes you like a flight a flight attendant could walk in right it's yeah you don't, want to do that. you don't sometimes know you go out and flush it outside the bathroom but if you what's more surprising is when you tell italians like you guys <laughs> you know everybody flushes differently it's so personal they're like of course they do yeah they're not like oh we're so crazy they're like are there countries where it's super standardized and cold and unfeeling? And you're like, yeah, that's how it is everywhere. They all flush right there. Yeah. So like we're not, I promise we're not going to spend an hour talking about toilets. But when I moved to Australia, people were like, look at the toilet. Cause I hear because of like, now you're in the Southern, that whole thing. Like it goes in a different direction. I didn't notice that. I don't know. Putting an egg or something like that. I don't know. I think it's, I think someone made that up. I don't know if that's true. Anyway, I'm sure we'll learn in the chat. <laughs> well, aren't there jets in the toilet that control the direction it goes? It's not just like water from the, from, you know. Full forces. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. I think, but I think what I enjoy in the book so much is because Australia is not, you know, a wildly otherized place. It's familiar. But there's, it's, there's sort of, it's like passing into some other dimension of America, at least in this book. Mm -hmm. And it's like, things are sort of, they're driving on the other side, but that's okay. But what's more strange is that it's an ibis instead of a pigeon, or it's, you know, the possum that is a major character in the framing plot of the book. The particular way people talk and the way she notices billboards and, and one particular billboard in the way I don't think we would at home, mm -hmm. um, but it just sort of keeps speaking to her as, as it only would to a foreigner. Well, when I, so um, I moved, so I lived in Perth for three and a half years with my husband and our two children. And when we first arrived there, I could not get over the birds. It is so difficult to describe the Australian bird life but it is as if you had stepped into a Disney film or something. There are huge, colorful, loud birds everywhere. Um, just as the sun is coming up, it is just like complete chaos outside. And so I spent, you know, the first month or, or so, like every time I would meet someone, I would remark on the birds until I realized that was not interesting talk for them <laughs> <laughs> it was it was just totally boring birds as far as they were concerned whereas I just couldn't believe I mean there was like this flock of black cockatoos that would come to our tree and they were each you know like a foot and a half high and they'd raise their wings and there'd be red underneath it's just like the most glorious birds you've ever seen. And then they just go at it and start having breakfast in the tree and throwing everything down and ripping whole branches out. And I mean, I just find that fascinating that people live normal lives going to the store and going to work and taking their kids to school while like walking past flocks of, yeah, ibises, who by the way are incredibly prehistoric looking. Well, have you ever had like European friends visit and they see a squirrel and they stop and okay. they have to take photographs? Cause they're like, it's for them, that's the most adorable thing they've ever seen. It's like the tiniest little puppy. I like, think it was, I think it was our, 
<laughs> I think it was our first grocery store trip when Dave, my husband was wearing a t-shirt with a squirrel on it. And the woman working at the store was like, is that a squirrel on your shirt? <laughs> That's my favorite animal. And I thought, I don't think I know anyone who would say the squirrel is their favorite animal. Like, I don't have a problem with squirrels, but yeah. But, you know, I am a big animal lover, but the possum is the one animal that I don't like, never have, can't explain it, just get really weird vibes about possums. So I did um, feature a possum in the book. I, which is I won't my, say too much about it. Yeah, it's, I also, it grossed me out. They grossed me out. Just the weird way that you can see their skin through their hair, all of it. And the eyes. With the nose that's longer than it should be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-uh. Not good. Not good at all. Um, <laughs> I maybe we keep having these technical questions for you. Um, we can we can get into more technical questions. I mean, it's kind that's of fine. like um, we, have, we have room at the end for Q and A, so people. Will yeah, ask yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, this is what because I was working on this with something today, and I kept making my trying to work with going in and out of memory. And I would have a scene, and then I would have like asterisk, asterisk, new section. Then I would be like, years ago, da 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 da, and then I would make the whole thing with full of like tassels on the chairs and the pattern on the carpet and come to life. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. <laughs> um, he's back in the, you know, whatever, come back to the present. And it's so clunky. And I was reading yours and you move smoothly in and out um, with, without those breaks, even though there are breaks in the book, chapter breaks of, and the chapter is something like five pages sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and there are bits of white space between the paragraphs. And you've said that that is about wanting to, to emulate sort of bursts of, of memory as well. Mm -hmm. I, I, my, I don't know what my question is. I admired it and I wanted to know how you knew to put the memory in and how you knew to hold back enough so that we st we weren't taken out of the, the story. We, we didn't become lost in another story. Yeah, I mean, I would like to take full credit for that, but some of that um, weaving things together thing came in for me a little bit better towards the end when I had a professional editor who may or may not be on this call, but Chris Heiser at Unnamed Press is fabulous. And um, he was really great at also saying like, is this necessary or could this be somewhere else? So we did a little bit of shuffling at the end together. Um, but I write, I mean, I don't want to get too much in the weeds for people who will get bored of like, you know, all the technical stuff, but I do use Scrivener when I write, which is a software program. Do you use Scrivener or no? Yes. Okay. So, um, and it's basically um, a way of writing where you see on the left-hand column, all of your scenes and chapters. Um, and so you can just get a quick snapshot of your entire novel, um, which I find really helpful because I was working just in Word before and it would get, everything would get lost. So what I did was I wrote, I mean, I knew the only way I would write this book is to just write small um, fragments at a time because the idea of writing a novel was really daunting for me. Um, I had written short stories. And I have a blog called One Woman Party that everyone should check out and subscribe to because that's where I just play around and post things up for fun. Um, so I had written nonfiction and fictional short stories, but the idea of doing an entire novel felt pretty daunting. Um, so the only way I could do it is to sort of break it down into tiny stories. And then so I had all of those stories and memories, and then I would play with them and shuffle them. So, um, you know, when you read the book, sometimes there'll be a flashback to uh, say an experience that Edie had with her father when she was when she was a young child that probably was in four different places in the book um, before it actually became the final version. Uh, okay, that's that's you, good. You, to know. Is that is that what you do as well? Like, do you end up like moving whole parts around constantly? Yeah. But I, I was looking at yours and being like, I think I can make it smoother. I think I can lose some detail and make it more like a sort of a flowing memory instead of a like narrator taking you back. Like, yes, right. Like you don't have to sew all the eighties costumes and buy the rights to Cindy Lauper's girls just to want to have fun. I can just have a little moment. Yeah. Yeah, 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 totally. Um, first of all, the idea that you learned anything about writing from my book 
<laughs> is incredibly flattering. <laughs> Let me put it this way. I'm planning to, to say steal that. it and not credit you. Great. You're totally, you've done so much for me that you are welcome to that. Um, but you know what? I have next to me um, just a stack of some of my favorite books. And, Great, Lydia, and Lydia Davis is in here. Um, and she has many books, but this is a collection of her stories. And I learned a lot about fragment writing, I would say, from Lydia Davis. And I strongly recommend her if there's people in here who have not read her work. Um, but in the way that she, yeah, she leaves a lot to the reader. Um, I like that. I like that. I like that we trust, we can trust readers to do what they want. We don't have to spoon feed it to them. And if the reader doesn't know exactly what year that memory took place in, I don't think that that matters because we don't even know that about our own lives. Like I'll talk about something that happened to me when I was a kid. I couldn't tell you what year it was. I'll just make, I'll just fill things in, you know? And I think if, when a reader has to fill in some of the blanks in a book, they get more attached to it because they have put that living room from their childhood. They put, they start to fill it in with their experiences. And so yeah. the book is, is very individually theirs and unlike someone else's reading experience. And so they feel a little more yeah. closer to it. That's true. I didn't think of it that way, but you're right. I like that. They show, probably show feel more ownership. Um, so I have, is, is that because you knew this was in there? No, I didn't. <laughs> Story of a Marriage, guys, this is probably my favorite book by Andy. Um, so I have I have some books that, let's see, I have um, Amy Fusselman, The Pharmacist's Mate. This is, um, have you read this? No, I haven't read that. You have to read this book. It is okay. so good. And it is another delightfully short novel. And this is one of the books that I, when I read it, it stuck with me forever. And I also thought, um, like, oh, a book can be like this, you know? Like a book can be a beautiful, small sort of journal entry type of novel. You don't, there's not one way to write a novel. Um, and I also, the other one I'll call out is An Everlasting Meal by Tamar Adler, which is a book about cooking. Okay, I'm writing so that some down. Of, some of, here, I'll put it up so you can see it. Or, you I'm know, people, yeah. people can like, uh, one of our lovely guests can put these in the chat for everyone to look at. Oh, that's a good idea. Um, you know, right? Because right? we're all helping, we're all helping each other through this. Um, so this is called An Everlasting Meal by Tamar Adler. It is a book about cooking, but it is, um, it's so much more. <laughs> the way she writes, she has a whole chapter on eggs that makes me cry every time I read it. She has um, a deep dedication to making your own stock that is heartbreaking to read and beautiful. And um, so I, I certainly get writing tips, I would say from sources that are not just fiction. Um, and that's an example of one of them. So I always keep that book near me for inspiration. Oh, before we get into the questions, this is just a question that I had. At one point, a few times, I think, Edie is accused of being immature, selfish, and then at one point, cruel. Mm -hmm. And do you think she's cruel? I always wonder how much to say what I think about my own characters. Um, I, I love Edie. Um, I want her to come to life so I can thank her <laughs> for letting her be a part of my life for so long. Um, she, Edie is very idiosyncratic. She um, says how she feels. She says what she thinks. She is not too concerned with um, breaking social norms. And I guess sometimes that could come off as cruel, <laughs> um, misinformed at best, perhaps. But I mean, she's certainly a, a fantasy of you know, I wouldn't mind walking around the world once in a while with that kind of, with that attitude. And I'm, um, I'm a friendlier person than Edie for sure. And it was very fun to write a character who doesn't really make much of an effort in the friendly department. That was fun. Yeah. Like, I think that being kind is, is um, one of the most important 
things we can do in our life. And I, I'm not sure Edie would agree with that. And yet I didn't, I wasn't put off by her. I think I identified her through the storytelling so much that I, when I heard her being called cruel, I was like, oh gosh, am I cruel? Am I falling for something cruel? I can't, <laughs> no, and the book's about self and identity. And I see Maris has appeared perhaps oh. to remind us that it's <laughs> question and answer time. It sure <laughs> is, um, but we need questions from you. So if, if you, uh, have one, please put it into the chat, which is on the right hand side of your screen and, um, and we'll get to them. I do have one that was uh, messaged to me from Lucia Agnello says, uh -huh. Rebecca, what would your pre Alzheimer's dad say about this novel? Oh, um, what a wonderful question. Lucia is a friend of mine in Perth and her son just got married, congratulations. <laughs> um, what would my father think of this book? Well, my father, I don't, he was a big um, reader of nonfiction. Um, he read some fiction, but my memories of him are reading nonfiction. And he, I'm not sure he'd, um, he'd probably read the whole thing. I think he'd probably read it, but you know what he would do is he would like, um, buy 30 copies of it and give them away and like treat everyone to a coffee at his cafe um, the day my book came out. He would be very proud, yeah. Hmm. Uh, Matthew asks for both of you, I am not a novelist, so I wonder, are you ever surprised by your character's fates? This <laughs> is the very famous, famous poet, uh, Matthew Zapperder, so. Oh, hi, Matthew. No oh. novelist. Oh, um, am I ever surprised? Yeah, I think occasionally when I'm working on a story, um, I, I can see what's going to happen to a character and I, there's just no going about it. Something's, yeah, something bad is going to happen and it's my job to carry that out for them. Um, for sure, yeah. I don't try to save characters too often. What about you, Andy? I want you to answer that question too. I, we, you know, it's hard to answer for me because I, 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 um, I make mistakes in the first draft so much that, of course, it surprises me. Like, but usually, what surprises me is when I get to the point of revision where I realize why the character did that. Um, and yeah. that's why the first draft is bad, is that the character did something I didn't know why, so I sort of phonied my way through it with mm -hmm. fancy language. And then in revision, I, was, I, I get to understand, I was like, okay, either I see why, or I see that I will never know why, and that I have to embrace that or something. Right, right, like the motivation might come in later. Yeah, that yeah. shows. I got a question here that was sent to me directly, and it's so charming, I'm going to ask it, if it's okay, Maris. Okay. From Mo Correct. Um, animals. In the book, some are characters themselves and some are props in the storyline. Where do, where do magpies reoccur? What do you think about the magpies? This was actually one of the, the questions I had for you, which was what happens when you put an animal like Frisbee into a novel? Like how does it change a novel differently from a person? Mm. Um, yeah, I love writing animals. I think it's really fun. I mean, I've never written anything from the perspective of an animal. And for people who have not read the book, there's no, there, the animals don't speak in this book. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> um, the magpie is probably my favorite Australian animal. So magpies, um, otherwise sometimes people call them cowbirds. They, they're black and white spotted um, birds that are, uh, very loud and have strong opinions about things and will attack you during mating season. They, um, the magpie has a very long memory. They have a long lifespan and a long memory. So there's been research studies where magpies, the same bird will remember a face after not seeing it for 20 years, a human face. Human face? Yeah. Um, so it was really easy for me. I had to play the magpie carefully because it would have been very easy for me to sort of overutilize a magpie in a story about memory loss. Um, 
And I was actually surprised when I saw the cover designs that there was not a single one with a magpie on it because I was sure <laughs> that someone would pull the magpie out if they knew that about their memory. Um, but yeah, I love putting, I love putting animals in, in books. I think it's fun. And there is a cat um, named Frisbee that Andy referenced that comes to join them in Australia. And that yeah, so Frisbee has a fate as well. We all have fates, but yeah. <laughs> now, also the way you use the animals, it feels like also the way you use details that they can sort of, they don't reflect her emotional state because they are neutral, mm -hmm. you know? And they have no judgment they just exist. Mm -hmm. um, and that is part of what's startling about the sort of new world she enters and her own, um, not coldness, but closed. Mm. Um, but that there is, there is life out there and, and she's not alone, but she's, there's no way to contact it somehow. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. these things. I yeah, that's what a great question. What a fun question, animals. <laughs> it's what's for dinner. Hey. <laughs> oh, sometimes. Okay. Um, here's a question from Seth Kessler. How did you come up with the name Edie Richter? Oh. Um, hi, Seth. I'm so glad he asked that question because Edie, I don't know if I've ever told anyone this, but Edie is inspired by, um, uh, I know a woman or, or family actually who, um, who I haven't seen in a while, but they have a daughter who is probably about 12 and um, her name is Edith spelled with a Y and they call her Edie. And um, from the minute I met that child, that name stuck with me. Um, I just thought um, I'm sort of partial to like old lady names on kids. Um, I named my first daughter Willa <laughs> as an example. Um, and I thought that Edie was just a beautiful name. So that stuck with me. Um, so that was, so that child inspired the name Edie. And then Richter, I wanted a name that um, was sort of a nod to like German Jewish ancestry. So I played with several names. And then once I came up with Edie Richter, it just, it sounded like a name. Hannah McNeely asks, what was the experience of writing that first draft like for you? Oh, hi, Hannah. Congrats on your baby. <laughs> this is so fun to like <laughs> know some of the people who are asking questions. Um, the experience of writing the first draft, uh, yeah, little by little, um, just took it a little bit at a time. It, um, I would say I completed a first draft in, a year, but let me clarify, it was a terrible first draft. And I also um, had this incredible luxury of when I was in Perth of not working, like not needing to work for money. So I was in this weird position. I am not in that position now, but I was in that position there where I had a lot of time. And so um, that was a gift, but it was, yeah, it was a messy first draft. I mean, there, their first drafts are really, really crappy. And you just have to know that it's, it's going to get better and you have to be brave enough to maybe show it to someone who, um, God can just read it and still love you. So that was Dave, my husband, he's always been my first reader. And so he read that, he read that first draft. And then we had a, we went to, um, a cafe where we got crepes and coffee and had a business meeting about how terrible it was now. <laughs> Well, ways, ways that it could improve. Yes. Yeah. And the second draft was much better, but stick with it. I think it's so easy to get, um, to get really put off by a first draft and feel like there's no way this is going to come together. And I mean, Andy has had way more experience in this, of course, than I have. Um, but I've heard, I've talked with you about first drafts before and how you really have to love yourself and you have to believe in yourself. Or pretend you do, even if you don't. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to know because you go across that finish line and you're like, I did it. Mm -hmm. And then you look down and you're like, I'm naked. Like you didn't do it. Like yeah. you yeah. didn't do it at all. But no. it's like, then you feel like I can't, then I can't do it. And it's very hard. You have to find a right reader who understands what a first draft is. 
and a lot of editors I think don't, they, they lose heart because they can't, but of course they can't see the book that's in your head and how, how close or far away it is. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So it's good to have someone who, who doesn't force it, but tries to figure out where you want it to go because usually yeah. a first draft can go a lot of different ways. Um, and a lot changed, I mean, from the first draft to the final. Um, and I don't want to say too much about that because it might give some things away in the book, but a lot, yeah, a lot changed along the way. And I added characters, I removed characters, um, changed ages of people. Um, for a long time, Edie was 10 years younger than she is now, um, but that wasn't working. So, yeah. This might be an excellent question to end on for both of you. Erin McClary asks, what are you working on next? Hi, Erin. Um, I am working on another novel. So slowly but surely. And so here I am in first draft land again. Um, I have not finished a first draft. I'm nowhere near a first draft, but I'm having a lot of fun writing a story about a woman who starts to believe that her life could be a play and that there is an audience watching. Um, and it takes place over the course of one night. And I started this before we entered Zoom land. And it's very interesting now because sometimes you are feeling like an audience is watching you. <laughs> like right now. Like maybe right now. <laughs> so yes, but thanks for asking. And hopefully I will finish that draft at some point. <laughs> you're going to read that. I'm, I'm, for me, I'm not going to say anything about it because I'm in the, in the second draft mode of tossing everything into the garbage and it's not alive yet. Mm -hmm. on the it's all mm -hmm. pieces, so I'm... It's a collage. The collage. It's going to be great. I believe in you. Thank you. <laughs> you got it, kid. Keep it up. Okay. <laughs> well... Rebecca and Andy, thank you so much. This was such a pleasure. And thank you to this audience for um, being so wonderful. And uh, please remember to buy a book if you haven't yet. Y'all wanna read this yes. book. Please, please buy it. You won't <laughs> regret it. <laughs> yeah, and as your brother often says, it is rude to enter an independent bookstore and leave without a book. And you have just entered an independent bookstore, everybody. Oh, <laughs> nice. I like that. Thank you. And that's not my dog. Whose dog is barking? Your dog? Oh, oh, it's my dog. Yeah. Oh, yeah. your dog. Hi, puppy. <laughs> <laughs> He's a naughty girl. Animals. <laughs> Animals. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Andy. It's been a pleasure. And thank you, McNally Jackson, for hosting and Maris and Unnamed Press. I have a good, good crew behind me. I feel very lucky. Andy, this has been a pleasure. <laughs>